Ready for something a bit different? A Reddit comment on some random D&D sub. They don't worship a god. I'm the DM. I'm their god. I decide who lives and how they avoid making a new character. I have to write personal stories for. They die to a vampire bite, so the party gets sad, kills the vampire, then holds a funeral for their friend. Then their girlfriend imagines they can still feel his arms around her. Stealth check to see if she can notice he is actually there. Romantic scene. Then he bites her. He's back alive with new vampire tricks, a new thirst for blood, and without a master to command him. Until the vampire comes back and takes control. Can he resist the control? What will it take to free him? Can he be cured? Does he want to? Can he control the thirst? Does his girlfriend mind a little nip every now and then? What did I just read? Oh my god, this is when D&D gets turned into smut fanfiction. And you know what? I'm sure somebody would be perfectly into that. Um, I don't know, though, if this DM asked if their players are into that. And, um, they probably should. Actually, scratch that. They definitely should. Background. I finally started a campaign for my friends who have been asking me for years to start back up. I started playing Dungeons & Dragons back in college with my high school buddies, but we all moved to different states. At the start of the virus, I had extra time, so I created a fun little campaign for us, but hadn't played since then. Playing online is a lot more work than playing in person, and I'm just okay with computers. In the meantime, I started my career, got a master's degree, and had a kid, so I've been pretty busy, but my friends kept bugging me. And since I have more time in the summer, I sat down and designed an adventure for us. The group consisted of my best friend and his wife, who I had played with before, my other best friend from high school, who had never played but is very into nerdy stuff, and the vocalist from my old band, who admittedly just wanted to do the combat part and be silly. To start off, I created a little prologue adventure. Players played pre-made characters to learn the basics of Dungeons and & Dragons and understand the events that are kicking off the campaign. The game went great, players wanted more, and they were excited to play again. The characters. So, my players created their characters and we all discussed how they would fit into the story. And there was already a worrying amount of chaotic neutral energy. I'm not a big fan of the classic alignment chart, almost entirely because of chaotic neutral. I feel players often misunderstand alignment and use it to justify annoying behavior. But the characters consisted of a zealous but inexperienced cleric, a snake oil selling rogue, plans on being a swashbuckler, a druid with Alzheimer's, the player even asked if her character could get disadvantage on intelligence and dexterity saving throws while the sun was going down, and an Alex Jones-inspired bard. So, already some red flags from my perspective, but I want players to have fun and do their thing, so I accept them. The campaign. So, I decide to start with the cleric, and the only first-time player. His parish, parish, right, gives him a quest to investigate a mysterious church that has appeared in a nearby forest. He is told to hire some locals to help him on his quest. I had the player characters along the path for this character to conveniently run into. Are there better ways to introduce players? Probably, but we all know it's a bit awkward to give players a reason to work together. The problem. Those problems. Well, they started almost immediately. The rogue is introduced the way the player asked to be introduced, by peddling some snake oil to the locals. Rolls a 16 on a performance check. He's doing good. Then, the cleric wishes to know if this is a scam. He rolls a nat 20 on a perception check. I feel like it should be, like, insight or investigation. I mean, come on. We all roll perception like a thousand times a day anyway. Ah, anyway, uh, the rogue, who is a very experienced player, tells the cleric what he's doing, that it's a sham, yada yada. The cleric responds by stating he wants to incinerate the people involved with burning hands. The rogue jumps in to talk him down, but the cleric uses the classic, this is what my character would do, before I break to intervene. I ask maybe if there's something the rogue can do, uh, perhaps donating to the church to atone for his sins, and the cleric accepts. They move to the Alex Jones-inspired bard, yelling conspiracy theories at the crowd. I was honestly looking forward to this the least. The rogue and the bard got stuck in an argumentative loop, and neither were good enough at improv to get out of it. But again, they didn't want to break character, so I again had to break the fourth wall to help them, and they add the bard to the party. The bard was actually the most helpful in moving things along. Finally, 
We get to the sundowning druid. I made things easy. Massive bugs were attached to the trees by her little woodland cottage. The rogue jumps into action and one-shots one of the bugs. The druid reacts by attacking the rogue. The cleric then wants to cast Burning Hands again. The druid wants to cast Burning Hands as well. It's, it's all just falling apart now. I really can't stand when players attack other players. I gave the newbie a pass because it was his first time, but these people I've played with often. The bard, in character, says that this is stupid, and he's continuing on the path towards their adventure. They can either join him or not. I thank him out of character for trying to stay on track. The druid responds by saying, I have no reason to join them. I was very frustrated. I literally handed her a reason to be indebted to the party, and she turned it on its head. By this point, nearly two hours had gone by, and we had made basically no progress. I stopped the game. I told them I was sorry and that maybe we could try again next week. I messaged them all separately and explained that I made some sacrifices and put a lot of work in to just listen to them bicker for two hours and not take advantage of opportunities to work together. There are certainly things I could have done better, but I felt pretty insulted. Was I out of line? Before I really get going, I want to clarify that although the bar did end up working out, and I'm glad about that, the DM does have the right to veto characters that they are not comfortable with allowing in their game. I think that that is perfectly okay. If you feel like there are certain alignments that would fit better into your campaign, or there are backstory elements you don't like, you have the right to say no. You're not indebted to your players. I don't think you should be tyrannical about it, but you know, you should do what makes you comfortable. I also think that if a campaign is not working out to this degree, you also have a right to put your foot on the brake. I recently had to, for the first time in my D&D career, let a campaign fizzle out because of out-of-game stuff. And that's definitely the right thing to do, at least in my case. If I tried to let that campaign continue, it would have been a disaster. Look, I'm not saying that this game would have guaranteed been a disaster. Maybe it would have worked out. But are you willing to put in the hours and hours of work to try and make it work out? Or is it better to just let it go? This, at the end of the day, is a hobby you're playing for fun. You're not obligated to these people. I don't think you should give up at the first sign of trouble, but this seemed like a lot of trouble. And if it's too much trouble than it's worth, I don't see a problem in letting it go. Honestly, I never thought I'd post something here, or at least I hope not, because I had nothing but love for D&D since my uncle introduced it to me and Magic the Gathering as a kid. Like, he's the reason I had a group that I played with in school, but now I got a vent about my latest experience with the game. So as stated, I haven't played in a while, and sadly it has been hard finding decent people to play with in my area in person. So I decided to try the next best thing online playing. So I started looking at Roll20 and Discord servers looking for a game that sounded like it would be fun to join. Then I thought I found it. It read, old school players and newbies welcome. We use references and jokes from sources like movies, so if that bugs you, don't join. Mics are necessary. Now, I know metagaming and doing jokes isn't for everyone, but honestly, I love being able to crack up and have fun with my fellow party members while playing. Anyway, enough of my rambling, onto our cast we had Leaf, a half-elven bard who is hilarious and a chill dude. I mean, this guy is like the chill brother I always wanted. Then Rain, our tiefling monk, a complete sweetheart who just wanted to keep the peace. Tyler, a gnome artificer who just liked making the weirdest combos of weapons. Then Brown Noser, an orc barbarian who just wanted to live up to the DM's backside. I decided I wanted to be a tabaxi rogue with a twist. This twist came in the form of my background, and little did I know it would be a problem, apparently. To sum it up, my character had a twin brother she did her jobs with for years, till they had enough to retire. Then set up an inn slash tavern called the Queen's Jewels. Eventually, a small village formed up around it, and the brother and some locals called my character Queenie as her nickname. Not the most original, but the brother was a puckish type. Till later, he disappeared on a supply run. Hence, my character is going out to try to find out what happened to him, leaving a trusted friend at the village in charge of the inn. I gave the DM all of this info and a copy of my character sheet, which I started. Now, we did a few sessions together and everything seemed fine. That was until we got to my character's inn. My NPC friend, upon seeing my character, said, Queenie, and gave her a hug. Now, everyone in the party was okay with being able to stay at the inn and have stuff on the house, except Brown Noser, who felt the urge to comment. Why is that guy calling you a queen? You're not a queen. Plus, you don't have the right to say everything is comped for us. Why are you trying to control the game like this? It's rude. 
I was like, dude, this is my inn. I'm the owner along with my brother. This guy is our acting manager. And it's just a dumb nickname my brother started to annoy me. Even the other players were explaining, she owns the place. And if the DM wants to use it in the campaign, then that's his decision. But I guess something about Brown Noser saying the previous statement triggered our dungeon master. But anyway, the next thing you know, the NPC friend is telling us that people and kids are disappearing two towns over, similar to my brother. So, naturally, I wanted to go check it out to see if it was the same people or thing that made something happen to my brother. Everyone agreed, though Brown Noser somewhat reluctantly. We go through with it, seeing a notice on a board in the square asking for bodyguards for a noble child who had received a threat to be the next person taken. We head over, talk to the boy's father, and he agrees to have us watch over him in the night. Now this kid was a spoiled brat to a T. He demanded we entertain him till he goes to sleep. So I suggested we sing the old carol of, do you want to build a snow human? Frozen reference, because I was in a weird Disney mood at the time. The others thought it was hilarious and wanted to do it. Once again, Brown Noser accused me of trying to take over the game. I was like, dude, it was just a suggestion. This time, even the dungeon master piped up saying that I need to stop stepping on his toes. At this point, I'm like, Okay, if you guys are gonna be butthurt over me just suggesting stuff, then I'm gonna go for the day. Later, I get a message from Rain where she said the DM was mad because I was trying to take over his location he made for the story. And if I did it again, he was kicking me. I was just like, that is the end my character made from my background. I even sent her the same file I sent the DM showing how it was the background I wrote for my character. She was then saying, what the hell? He is claiming that he wrote it. I was like, I don't know. I don't know why him and Brown Noser are acting like this. She then apparently sent the file to everyone else in the group chat and was like, why are you guys starting stuff over a background she wrote specifically for her character? If you didn't want her having interactions with someone who would know her, then don't use her stuff from that background, which everyone, with the exception of DM and Brown Noser, was like, yeah, why would you expect her not to be able to do stuff if she knows the people, plus she literally owns the place? The DM then messages me, saying, I'm going to keep using the inn and your character as the keeper there, but you're going to have to make a new character if you want to keep playing with us. I was just like, are you serious? And he was like, yeah, since you want to be difficult about stuff, that's the only way this will work. I was like, it's so difficult if I don't want to let you just plagiarize a background I wrote and be able to have interactions with characters I know since they're a part of my character story. Especially since you're the one that decided to start that interaction in the first place. He was like, exactly, I started the interactions, so it's my in and stuff to control, and you don't have a say in it. And I was like, okay, clearly you don't get how D&D should work. It's a story and world building experience you're supposed to do with your players. Not you stealing their work, claiming it as your own, then getting pissy because they don't do stuff exactly the way you want. Then I left the group. I talked with the others explaining what happened. They wanted me to come back, but I just couldn't deal with those two again. And sadly, that is that. TLDR. DM liked my character's background so much that he and his brown noser tried to steal it and claim it as his own. When I showed proof that I wrote it, he then demanded I make a new character or leave. Since he wanted to keep the background I wrote and my character as an NPC, I left rather than deal with the toxicity. I forgot to record the analysis for this one. My bad. So yeah, I guess we're recording it now. This behavior is really, really bad. It's even worse because it's encouraged by a yes man, something that I am habitually terrified of. I'm always very self-conscious about my own neurotic decisions, and I'm always terrified the people saying, no, Crispy, it's okay, are just yes men. It's important to have people who are critical in your life, and it's okay to have people who agree with you, obviously, but agreeing to this degree is bad because the DM's decisions here are definitely not great for the game. What the DM is doing here is targeting a player for engaging, for having a hook. And yeah, this might be somebody who is really enthusiastic, who's kind of feeding into that main character syndrome. But even if that is true, which I don't think it is, is this the way to go about fixing it? Punishing them in-game arbitrarily while also taking credit for their ideas? Not a really great idea. This person is engaging in the game in a positive way. They have a hook, and the DM is punishing them for it. And they've got a personal simp to help them do it. Not great. 
So I was mostly a bystander here, but I felt bad for who we'll call protagonist in this story. And despite having some familiar horror story themes, there are a few twists that I think Crispy and the Tavern will find interesting. This is a main character story along with heavy railroading. So about a year ago, I was pretty isolated, and thanks to COVID and some personal life circumstances, I had lost contact with a lot of my previous gaming groups. Before this, I'd never considered the idea of playing with strangers online, but I was desperate. So I went to the Roll20 looking for games forums and applied to several 5th edition games. I got a reply from a game master, I'll call him Rex, who was running an ongoing homebrew campaign in his own setting. He'd apparently had a player drop and was needing us to fill out a party. He'd advertise the game as very social and roleplay centric, with a strong focus on intrigue and political machinations, and less focus on combat. I liked the sound of that, as it seemed unique and off the beaten path from your typical hack and slash dungeon crawl. I got sent a Google Doc with an explanation of the world and wasn't exactly impressed. It was pretty basic with an evil lord ruling over an obviously evil nation, a neutral nation torn by an open civil war for their throne, and an obviously good nation ruled by a kind queen. No matter, it probably won't be Game of Thrones, but the GM might surprise me, and at least it was a game. I came up with a true neutral, Knowledge Cleric, whose backstory I really liked, and Rex did too, but it isn't really relevant to the story. What matters is that due to circumstance, my Knowledge Cleric was entering the game under house arrest at the Good Queen's Castle. In the first session, I found out about the rest of the party. There was Artificer, War Cleric, and there was supposed to be a Whoreforged Bard, but they never showed up. However, mostly there was Sir Thomas Colliar played by protagonist, a lawful good fighter and knight of the good kingdom. Sir Thomas was engaged to the good princess, and the kind queen relied on him heavily in order to deal with the rising turmoil of the time. I was a bit confused at first because the session started with the rest of the party shrunk to the size of mice, and in the middle of some farcical animal court getting shouted at by a mouse king? Huh? Honestly, the party seemed just as befuddled as I was by what was going on, but thankfully, it didn't last long as the Mouse King told them he would let them go if they promised to do him a favor and then magically teleport them back into the Queen's Castle, right outside the tower where Knowledge Cleric, my character, was being held. I would soon learn that getting magically teleported around by demanding NPCs was a regular staple of this game. Knowledge Cleric met everyone and immediately struck up good chemistry and roleplay. After meeting the party, the kind queen summoned Sir Thomas and he was told to bring Knowledge Cleric along. My character was basically getting put on probation. As long as he served Sir Thomas and was literally handed to Sir Thomas in chains, it turns out the whole party was essentially just Sir Thomas's entourage by some circumstance or another. All the NPCs pretty much only talked to him and put their expectations upon him and treated everyone else like just an extension of him, Sir Thomas. Now, I know this sounds bad and, you know, it was, but not for the reason you probably expect. Sir Thomas was played by protagonist, and he was actually a wonderful player. Despite being pushed into the main character role, he treated everyone in the party as peers and equals, often deflecting attention and glory, and turning what few decisions he was told to make over to the group. In the story, he had every right to boss us around or dominate the spotlights, but he never put a toe over that line. He literally couldn't get the chains off my character fast enough when I joined, and then never brought up the fact that he was basically Knowledge Cleric's pro probation officer ever again. I never really talked to protagonists outside the game, but I quickly got the distinct impression that he was uncomfortable with the party dynamic being pushed by Rex. At the end of my first session, there was a weird dream slash vision sequence where each of us got whisked away into a private voice channel with Rex and manipulated into accepting a pact where we got ridiculously overpowered powers but also pretty big drawbacks. I don't know exactly how everyone else's pact was presented, but Knowledge Cleric basically saw an NPC in dire trouble, begging for help. When he tried to ask questions, he was told, there was no time for it, help them or they will die. I learned later that by helping the NPC in the division, Knowledge Cleric had accepted a pact with the Dark Lord. The power he got at level four was the ability to cast resurrection at will with only one action and without any spell components. Knowledge Cleric could basically just touch any dead remains and bring them back to life 
whenever he wanted. Knowledge Cleric's drawback was that he now craved humanoid flesh and couldn't eat any other kind of meat. This seemed insane to me, but based on what the other setting character, my pact, was one of the more mild ones in the entourage. Sir Thomas came out of the vision, literally glowing with radiant charisma, like some kind of angel. And this was just the first session. The sessions that followed were mostly a series of NPCs telling Sir Thomas to do things, and then using magic or special authority to whisk him and the entourage to said task, with no perceivable option to choose not to take the quest, nor to choose how we went about it. Warforge Bard never came back and was replaced a couple sessions later by a warlock who was literally sold to Sir Thomas as a servant slave. Sir Thomas only bought him in order to rescue him and give him his freedom, but Warlock, with little other path to joining the story slash party, decided to stick around and join the entourage. Also, I know Rex advertised the game as low combat, but the whole time I played in this game, there were only two proper combat encounters, and one of them was cut short when an NPC just snapped his fingers and killed the remaining enemies so that the party could move along with the story. I know now that I wasn't the only player frustrated by the fact that the majority of my character's abilities were basically just superfluous numbers on a paper because we never had any combat. After several sessions, I could tell our war cleric was getting weary of it all, and I think Rex decided to jump the gun on replacing him and invited a rogue to join, who literally was just a guy we met. He wasn't given any reason to join the entourage, and we just suspended disbelief when he followed us around and all the NPCs started treating him as another member of Sir Thomas's entourage. The railroad was really strong. However, the thing about this game was that the other players we're great. I already talked about how much of a good sport protagonist was, but all the player characters were really fun to play with. Warlock was delightful, and I hit it off with him right away, both in-game and out of game. War Cleric was clearly feeling discouraged by the way the game was going, but we had some excellent roleplay scenes, and we also got along well in character and out of character. Artificer was fun and a really good role player, but it was clear he was close friends with Rex in real life and was a bit defensive of Rex, his world, and his plot. Rogue was only in the game for a few sessions, but he was the most dissatisfied with the way things were going and the most willing to try and buck the tracks, which inevitably led to the ultimate train wreck. Rogue was constantly trying to split away from the party and do his own thing. I don't think he was trying to undermine the party, but he wouldn't explain what he was up to, and his efforts often inadvertently did undermine the party, because Rex would try to shut down anything that deviated from what Sir Thomas was doing, or what Rex wanted the party to do by making NPCs hostile, incooperative, or twisting rules negatively, until the player pushing a deviation relented and went back to being a contented member of the entourage. This made Rogue a pain in the butt for all of us, even though I could totally sympathize with his urge to buck the rails. This culminated in a session where Protagonist was unable to attend, so Rex was trying to just fill time, waiting for his main character to return. Rogue rebelled and started poking NPCs in all the wrong ways, refusing to stay with the group, nor really explaining to Rex or the rest of the entourage what he was trying to accomplish. Rex eventually just blew up at him, breaking character and yelling at him over the mic that he just couldn't deal with this and to stop being so difficult and just stick with the party, or at least tell them what he was up to, including him in his side plots. An argument broke out with everyone torn between trying to mediate some peace, but also falling into the urge to voice their own pent-up frustrations at both Rex and Rogue. It ended with Rogue just leaving the call never to be heard from again in a dramatic rage quit. Afterward, we did manage to have what felt like a productive discussion with Rex. We explained that we were feeling railroaded, and the constant string of powerful NPCs teleporting us around and allowing us no agency or initiative in the story was draining and frustrating. Rex seemed to listen and take the criticism well, but also said something that was a bit of a red flag. He said he was frustrated by how much time the party spent role-playing with each other and trying to do their own thing that he got bored and he felt like he had to interject with NPCs or use magic in order to move things along. He conceded, however, that he supposed he could work on planning ahead in the game while the players interacted with each other. Rex finished by saying he tried to be more mindful about giving the party agency and we called it for the night. Then, a week later, the Roll20 game and the Discord server got deleted without warning or any explanation from Rex. 
Warlock, War Cleric, and I were confused and luckily had friended one another on Discord outside of the server. We also managed to get hold of Protagonist. When I talked to Protagonist, I learned that he'd been increasingly frustrated by how the game was going and all the pressure he'd been put under to lead the party and carry the whole story. It'd make him feel like he couldn't complain or quit, but it hadn't been fun for him. At all. He'd eventually decided to tell Rex he wanted to leave the game. Apparently, Protagonist leaving, along with debacle we'd had the previous session, had caused Rex to just blow everything up and delete the game and the server. Horlock, War Cleric, and I decided to start our own gaming group, and I invited Protagonist as well, which led to the most heartbreaking part of the story. He told us that he appreciated the invite and hoped we could have a good game, but after how things had gone in Rex's game, he didn't think he liked D&D at all anymore and wasn't wanting to play again. I never heard from Protagonist, Rogue, Artificer, or Rex ever again, but Warlock decided to run Princes of the Apocalypse for me and War Cleric and a few other players we knew who were looking for a game in that time slot. Warlock is one of the best game masters I've ever had. The Prince of the Apocalypse game is going great, and the party is one of the best for taking the initiative and actively making their way through the plot on their own terms, while also having wonderful character roleplay and party cohesion. So it turned out well for me. I just feel sad sometimes when I think back to Protagonist and how Rex forced him to be the main character in his railroaded story, seemingly ruining this hobby for him. He was a really nice guy and a good player who had all the chances in the world to abuse the power given to him, but was always just a humble and gracious companion. Protagonist, if you're out there, you are a main character worthy of your entourage, and we remember you fondly, even though the game was something of a horror story. Something of a horror story? That was almost as bad as the airship. Okay, maybe it's not that bad, but I feel like that final twist is the one that just hits the hardest. Protagonist does seem like a great player, even though they were shoved into this really sucky limelight, they still managed to make the best of it, and in the end, they weren't into the hobby anymore. And that sucks. It shows the cost of running a game that is just a straight up horror story. It shows the cost of not properly facilitating the fun of the entire party. Protagonist didn't just stop playing the campaign, he quit the hobby. And I hope that one day he reconsiders, but you know, in the end, I don't blame him. This campaign was rough. I am glad the other players found their groove though and managed to start a game together. Bob Worldbuilder was on the podcast a while ago and he gave this exact same piece of advice. Guys, if your dungeon master sucks, obviously you can't just boot them because they run the game. But hey, you can all leave and one of you guys could be the dungeon master. One of you guys could take up that mantle and make an awesome campaign for yourselves. And that's what Warlock did here. Just props to the entire party and I hope one day Protagonist comes back to the hobby. Maybe you'll have a fun time, who knows. Sorry there was no bells and whistles in this one. I am making this the night after a seven hour drive back home from vacation. I had a lot of fun, but now we're in the aftermath and honestly, I just kind of want to get to bed. So let's get this outro done. If you guys enjoyed, then please do leave a like. If you want to see more of my content, then you can check out our Tabletop Tavern Tip series where we cover some D&D &D advice for DMs and players old and new. And while you're there in the cards, subscribe to Crispy's Tavern to get more of our content as it comes out. And finally, if you want to leave your own stories or thoughts, go down in the comments down below. If you can't think of a comment, leave the comment, Hesitant Mary Sue, to let me know you made it to the end of the video. Hey, by the way, if you have your own horror stories, send them to us in the description down below. There's an email where you can get a chance to be featured in one of these videos. But hey, even if you don't have any stories, in that's like, comment, subscribe. I will see you all next time. Farewell.